Uh, this morning, for a little time, we want to consider the theme, a clear illustration of Israel's salvation. And we have a little bit of a, a bouncing ball in the sense that in the study today, we're going to see how what happened to the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road explains what happened to Israel in the Old Testament and what God has promised will happen to them at the second coming of Jesus. And in understanding what God did in Israel and what God did in the life of the Apostle Paul, God also does in the life of all those who are saved by his grace, all those who become born again of his Holy Spirit. And so once again, we begin to see the patterns of the Bible where the Old Testament is interwoven into the teaching of the New Testament, and the New Testament explores and explodes with the truths that you and I are confronted with in our lives today. While the Bible is a book of history, it is mainly his story. Therefore, it is old, but it is ever new. So when we are reading of the ancient meanderings of an ancient people in the Old Testament, we observe that God is doing exactly the same today as he did then. Remember Jesus said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in this 11th chapter, the Apostle Paul is asking the question, Will God or has God cast away his people? In verse 2, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Now the Apostle Paul is doing what every preacher ought to do. He is not relying upon his own research. He is relying upon the Bible's research of itself. And that's where you find that the Apostle Paul, when he wants to defend a position to apply a doctrine, he will always take us into the very roots of where that truth was initially established. That's why we've often made reference to the principle of interpretation known as the principle of first causes. If you want to understand something that's happening in the New Testament, you'll very often find it explained in the Old Testament. And so the Apostle Paul will bring us constantly back to Old Testament references. And you will find, for example, that the statement that he makes in verse 2 of Romans chapter 11 is anchored in the words of the psalmist David. So David, although he is speaking messianically, he is also speaking prophetically. See, the Bible reaches across the generations, across the ages, and it touches God's people where they are in their times of need. That's why we read the Bible regularly, constantly, because God speaks to us. In prayer, we speak to God. Through His Word, He speaks to us. So, come with me in your Bible to the 94th Psalm. Psalm 94. And in this psalm, we want to go down to the 14th verse, Psalm 94. 
and verse 14. Now you'll notice that this uh, verse is nestled in the comforting expression of God's promise to his people. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. Now, the emphasis there is on an obedient heart. There is no thought of perfection or even completeness. It is simply the response of the heart of the child of God to the instruction of God. Blessed is the man whom you instruct. We go over into Psalm 119 and we read there of what is revealed and how God uses his word of instruction in the heart. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a guide unto our path and so on. And that that psalm gives us the benefits of knowing God's word. But here is the simple statement. The very fact that God teaches us is a blessing. There is greater blessing when we obey what he teaches. But what if we struggle at times with that? What if there are those moments in our experience where we know that we're not being fully committed? We're holding back. We're reticent about yielding to God's purposes. We look for excuses. We look for other avenues. We, we, we want to, to hold on to things that we are fond of or we desire, but yet we still want to do the right thing and follow God. What happens when we're not as willing to be obedient as we ought to be? Here is how the psalmist explains it. Verse 14, For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. Now these are the two key thoughts that the Apostle Paul is going to raise in chapter 11 of Romans. Now Paul will do this in a a different way. He will approach this theme, this principle of divine mercy and justice. He will approach all of this from a different angle. But you notice that it is couched in the framework, verse 14, the second part, the framework of God's in. Inheritance. Now, Paul will take this up in another epistle to another church, and he will remind us that, that we are Christ's inheritance. Our inheritance is in heaven. Christ's inheritance is in his people. So that is the basic concept and thought. So chapter 11 then will go on to explain how God is looking after, watching over, and maintaining his interest in what is his inheritance. So, the honor of God now rests upon God himself, not upon our ability or lack of to live our lives in honor of him. So, the psalmist David confirms, the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. Look at verse 15. But judgment will return to righteousness. And all the upright in heart will follow it. Now let me just slip in this little thought here and we will develop this as we go back into chapter 11 of uh, Romans. Look at verse 15. 
judgment will return to righteousness. In other words, discipline will return to restoration. The New Testament goes to great lengths to explain how God will chasten those whom he loves. And the chastening of God will always have the intended purpose of bringing us into the discipline of correction that will lead us to the willingness of obedience. Whom he loves, he chastens. Now let's look back at this verse 15 in Psalm 94. Note these words again. Judgment or discipline will return to righteousness or to restoration. Now who is the psalmist speaking of here? This is a reference to returned and restored Israel. God will not cast off his people. Why? Because they are his inheritance. And although they may not be obedient at this point in time, God will bring judgment and discipline and correction into their lives and they will be restored in order that they will benefit from the promises of God. So the Apostle Paul, as we go back over into Romans chapter 11, is not inventing a singular doctrine. He is not bringing up a thought that has evolved from his own mind, nor even his observation of what God is doing amongst the Jews of his time. But the Apostle Paul is going right back into the historical roots of the dealings of God with his ancient people Israel. He's going back to where it all begins. And everything that Paul speaks of in these three chapters, 9, 10, and 11 of Romans, concludes what God has begun in the Old Testament as he points us forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus. Come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. And here again we ask the question, did the ancient children of Israel have a, a conviction about this theme or this thought? How did these words sit comfortably uh, in the vocabulary of the people of God in these early times? We'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 12 and uh, let's look at verse 22. Now here is another thought, the same comment, but just phrased slightly differently. Verse 22, 1 Samuel chapter 12. For the Lord will not forsake his people, that is, cast off or abandon. Now note this slight variation. For his great name's sake. Now in the psalm, you recall that David referred to this as being the heritage of the Lord. What is the heritage of God in his people? It is his name. The honor of his name. And then we note, it has Please the Lord to make you his people. So there's the commitment. We're referring here to his people. But are they not a wayward people? What troubles did David have with Israel as he made his way toward the throne where God had anointed and appointed him as king over Israel. Israel. 
We read all through the books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, the devastating wars, the difficult times. And yet here is the promise. God will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Now, we won't take the time this morning, but I I sense that we're beginning to see the broadness of these references this morning and the security that they bring to the children of God. We are in safe hands when we are in the hands of God. It doesn't matter what happens around us in the world. It doesn't matter the chaos and the confusion. It doesn't even matter if we bemoan the fact that the church of God has weakened over recent times and the Word of God is not opened and preached as once it was fearlessly and boldly throughout our nation. Here is the assuring promise. We are in safe hands because God has made a commitment to His people and He will not, He cannot forsake His promise. Now, if we had the time to go through the book of Deuteronomy, we'd read there of how God set up His people, how He assured them that having led them out of Egypt and bringing them towards the promised land, that he had accomplished his purpose in them. And he would observe the rules of his own responsibility as he made them his people, and he became their God. He reminded them of the reasons why he had chosen them. It wasn't because they were a mighty nation. It wasn't because there was anything outstandingly good in their lives or behavior. It was simply because he had set his love upon them. Not only when he brought them out of Egypt, but right back there in the wilderness as he spoke with Abraham and confirmed to Isaac and to Jacob, God had set his seal of approval upon his people and God made commitment to them. And now God will not break his promise. So we come back over into Romans chapter 11 And verse 1, and we read these words of the Apostle. I say then, has God cast away His people? And note the emphatic response of Paul, certainly not. God has not, because God cannot. And if we were to imagine for one moment that God has swept aside His covenant promises to Israel, some of which have yet to be fully and finally fulfilled, if we dare to suggest that God has no more plans for Israel, but that we as the church have taken over all the responsibility and all of the benefits and all of the promises God gave to Israel, then we are denying the very nature of God and the essence of God. And we're casting doubt upon the trustworthiness of the promise of God. How often has it been in your life and mine when we have had nothing else to hold on to but the promise of God? And if the ground beneath our feet were to be disturbed with a spirit of unbelief, then we would say like the Apostle Paul, O wretched man that I am. But here is the truth of Scripture. God has not God will not, God cannot forsake 
His promise. Now let's see how the Apostle Paul develops this theme. I forgot to take my watch off. I didn't see what time I started, so we'll take it from now. Verse 1 of Romans chapter 11. Notice how Paul now turns the spotlight around so that it shines upon himself. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, a little look through the ancestral records of the Apostle Paul uh, uh, show um, reference to the fact that Paul is of a good lineage. He is of a good family tree. And there is a sense in which Paul can be proud not only of his natural birth, not only of how he developed in the system, but also because he is of good family stock. He's of royal blood. And and that can be traced right back into, uh, into the Old Testament. And maybe sometime, at some point, we'll, we'll go into that more fully. But here is what Paul is is simply saying. I also am an Israelite. So Paul is now about to explain that while his conversion, his salvation, was not the result of his natural birth, in terms of his spiritual benefit, there was no value in simply saying, I am an Israelite. Just as there's no value in you and I saying, but I was born in a Christian country, or I was born into a Christian home. These things are good. They're beneficial. They're helpful. But they will not allow us to lay any claim upon spiritual benefit or blessing. We're not saved because of our natural birth. We're not saved by our ancestry. I may have had grandfather in the ministry. I may have had uncles who have been ministers. I may have had a whole family circle of those who were engaged in the Lord's work. That doesn't make me a Christian. So Paul is not referring to the standard of his birth, or of his upbringing, nor even of his ancestry. What Paul is referring to here is the basis of what he has already committed to in chapters 9 and 10, and will continue to expand in the final verses of chapter 11, and that is the fact that God made a special people out of Israel. And as God made a special people out of Israel, God made a special promise to his people, Israel. And so now Paul is simply saying, I can tell you that God has still left the door open and a day will come when all Israel will hear and they will see and they will know that He is God and they will respond to His Messiah who was rejected at His first coming. I also am an Israelite. God has kept His promise and here and there God is stirring the hearts of individual Jews and they are turning to Christ. They are joining the church. They are becoming part of the body of Christ. But is that little trickle here and there, is that considered to be a fulfillment of God's promises of final restoration for Israel? The answer has to be no. God has a purpose that goes beyond the individual Jew who turns to Christ 
and is born again of the Spirit of God. God has a purpose for Israel. We're going to see a little bit more of that as we go through this 11 chapter. But come with me to uh, the book of Galatians as Paul begins to build up uh, this, uh, this argument. Galatians chapter 1. And if you have ever wondered why you are a Christian today, why God should ever set his love upon you, if you should ever wonder why you are saved and others that you know who are much better than you are, are not. Just listen carefully to these words uh, of the Apostle Paul. Galatians 1, verse 11 through to 16. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. The Apostle Paul did not have to go through the trauma of theological seminary. He learned it straight from God in the desert. A three-year course that qualified him with the special divine ordination of the nail-pierced hand. Those of us who have been ordained to Christian ministry knelt at one point or another before a congregation as those appointed by the church or the denomination laid their hands upon us and commissioned us for the work of God. But the Apostle Paul had the laying on of the hands of God as he was commissioned to take the gospel to the world. And here is how he explains it. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not the teaching of the Bible. It's not the exhortation. It's not the expressions from other believers. It's when you see Jesus that your heart is opened. The Apostle Paul was trained in the school of theology over which Gamaliel, the most informed and, and most dignified of all uh, professors of college, two main schools, Gamaliel was there. He was in the Oxford, uh, in the... Yale, he was in the top echelon of the academics of his time. And Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Not only did he hear the, from the professors, but he was taught by Gamaliel himself. He knew it all as far as the teaching of uh, the Jewish tradition and faith is concerned. But when it came to salvation... He was totally ignorant. He knew nothing. He wasn't taught anything by anyone in terms of the Christian faith. But as he was on his way down that road to Damascus, his ears filled with the noise of the thundering hooves of the stallion upon which he rode. Suddenly, he encountered God personally, powerfully, so much so that he was knocked off his horse and he was blind and he couldn't see. And when he opened the eyes of his heart, he understood that this was a touch of heaven. And everything that he had learned previously, that he had been building up in a storehouse, a special economy, so that when he stood before God. He could parade all of these virtues. Paul says they became as nothing. As he's now exposed 
to the presence and power of God. Now, let's read a little more. You have heard of my former conduct in Jerusalem, uh, in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy. That little word tried is put in there as an emphasis. If you see a word in italics in your Bible, it usually means that it's not literally found in the actual translation of the word, the Greek word itself, but it's there as an aid to help us to expand that thought. And here it perfectly describes, tried to destroy it. See, the devil has been trying to destroy the church of God through every generation. He has not and he will not succeed. Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, we are in safe hands. Now let's look a little more. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace to reveal His Son in me that I may preach Him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Something has happened now to Paul. Verse 15, God separated him. Paul knew nothing about this. He grew up. He applied to go to the school of Gamaliel. His heart was young and tender. He wanted to be equipped to be a professor in the law. But as he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, learning all about the traditions of the fathers, He did not know, but God had already separated him for the gospel. Look at verse 15. What did God do? Because he had separated him. God called him. See, God doesn't just take the first step and leave it there. Nothing is an obstacle. Nothing will prevent God from fulfilling his design, his purpose. So God separated him. Paul knew nothing about it. And Paul would have resisted it if he could. But God called him. And then look at verse 16. God revealed his son in him. Now how can we attribute this work in the heart of Paul Did Paul contribute to it? The answer is no. It's all of God. God is fulfilling His purpose. See, between the separating and the revealing, there is the calling. Before the calling, there was the rebelling. Look at how Paul puts it in verse 13. Persecuted the church of God. Now come down into verse 21 to 24. And let's see the difference. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the church in Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. That is the mark of genuine salvation. His heart totally changed. If you go over to Acts 9 and just look at verses 1 and 2, you'll see the venom and the anger and the malice that was in the heart of Paul as he set out to persecute the church. But now look at Paul's conclusion. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 
chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8 through to verse 10. Having spoken about the gospel in the first verses, having referred to the resurrection of Christ, he now adds his uh, name in to those who were witnesses of the resurrection. And here is reference to the Damascus Road experience. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, deserving to be cast off. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Paul's a new man. Why? Because God visited him in power on the road to Damascus. Now we go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy Chapter 1. And let's look at verse uh, 12 through to 15. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 15. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now here is his conclusion uh, in reference to his conversion. However, for this reason I obtained mercy. Now note that right at the heart of his conversion he now brings out the purpose of God. God had a purpose in his conversion. He was saved because of the purpose of God. Here it is. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Look at verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, don't lose this text. I'm coming back to it in just a moment. But in reference to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, let's just flick back to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Let's go down to the very last of the chapter. Verse 33, O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Paul is saying exactly the same. Now, with that in mind, let's go back over to 1 Timothy 
chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's look at the last part of verse 16. I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. I'm going to suggest to you this morning that you consider that just as Paul now inserts this text, this reference to the wisdom of God, in fulfilling his purpose. He does it here, and he concludes chapter 11 of Romans with the same thought, God alone is wise. So if you cannot understand it, you leave it to God. If you can't work it out, don't do, dare suggest that it's not going to happen. God's ways are greater than our ways. His thoughts are greater than ours. Now, here is the thought. Who is Paul referring to when he writes, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life? I'm going to suggest to you, and I will take you if time permits us through uh, references to, to bring this truth out. Paul is referring here to the nation of Israel. Those who will believe. Has God cast away his people? No. God has given a promise to them. Will God fulfill his promise? Yes, he will. Will Israel be restored? Yes, they will. How will they be restored? They will be restored by believing in the Lord Jesus. How will they do that? The prophets tell us exactly how that will happen. So let's look then at this verse in 1 Timothy and uh, the verse 16. I want you to pull out that little word as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him. Now, if we were to suggest that the pattern here identifies believers of today, that Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus is a pattern for all those who are going to become Christians in our time, in our day and generation, and for that matter, everyone who believed in the times of the early church and in the subsequent generations. Now, what is the pattern of the conversion of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus? We know he was smitten. He became blind. He was cast off from his horse and fell to the ground. If we say the day of Pentecost gives us the signs that one is filled with the Holy Spirit, we then have to say, well, if we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, we need to be in a building that shakes and trembles. We need to see a visible cloven tongue of fire sitting upon our heads. These signs took place then, but are they a pattern? The Bible tells us no. How are we filled with the Holy Spirit? We ask, we obey, we believe. Those are the three statements Scripture tells us conditionally will bring the Holy Spirit in all his fullness into our heart and life. You cannot be filled with the Spirit of God if you still have something of self in your heart. You can be partially filled, but you won't be filled with all the fullness of God if you're still harboring things that need to be dealt with, and need to be confessed, and need to be forgiven, and need to be cleansed. 
So what happened on the day of Pentecost is not a pattern to believers today in that we follow them in order to know we're filled with the Spirit of God. Nor is falling of a horse, being blind for three days, hearing a voice and seeing no man, and all of these things is not a pattern for those who believe. It's the simple trust of the heart. It's the yielding of the life. It's the confessing of sin. It's the repenting and turning from it. It's the acknowledging that Jesus alone can save us. It's recognizing that his precious blood alone can cleanse us from our sins. It's opening our heart to receive him as our Savior and our Lord. What then is the pattern that uh, the apostle is referring to. Well, if uh, time permitted, and we won't do this, we might take this up next Lord's Day, God willing. You will see how God will open up the way for Israel to believe. Zechariah the prophet in two great chapters spells it out in definite and in precise and in clear expression. In your study notes, you'll find some of those references. And if you want to, you can look at those at home through the week, and we may spend a moment uh, in introduction next Lord's Day simply looking at, uh, at how they relate. Israel, when Christ returns, will see him. As Jesus farewelled his disciples in Acts chapter 1, remember he said to them, this same Jesus, not another, this same Jesus will so come in like manner as you have seen him go. Revelation tells us when Christ returns, every eye will see him and those that pierced him will look upon him. And will. when Christ returns, the nation of Israel will receive a Damascus Road experience. And what happened to the Apostle Paul when his eyes were opened that benefit and blessing will be enjoyed by the nation of Israel. They will see him. And they will believe in him. They will accept him. And note what the Apostle Paul tells us. And with this we'll close. Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. Come with me. Verse 25 to 27. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You see, the Bible clock of prophecy has stopped. It is the 11th hour. We are in a period and a process referred to as the day of grace. The day of grace sees the times of the Gentiles. But the day of grace will end with the day of the Lord when Christ returns. And as the Apostle Paul explains here that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, what do we read from this text? It tells us God has a purpose. God does nothing haphazardly or at random. Everything God does, there is a purpose, and it coordinates and it fits in. 
There's a time and there's a place and there's a position and there's a power and there's an authority and God controls it all. And at the moment, Israel are blind. When they read the scriptures, they don't understand it because they're reading it through the law. But one day they're going to realize that Jesus is their Messiah. And that day will come when the times of the Gentiles has come to an end. And could I say at this point, if you are a Gentile, if you're an Aussie, or if you're privileged to be an Irishman, if you are here, lay hold upon this truth. You are now privileged to be living in the day of grace. But just before the flood, God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. God gave them 120 years. And after 120 years, God brought the family of Noah into the ark and God shut the door. And there was no handle on the inside nor the outside. The one who shut the door was the only one who could open it. And when the door was shut, the rains began to fall and the floods began to rise until the whole earth sat in the shadow of the floods of the wrath and the vengeance of a holy God. 120 years they labored in building the ark. 120 years the people had an opportunity to listen to Noah and to turn and repent. They didn't do it, and they were destroyed. One day, the day of grace is coming to an end. And you may not need to wait for that day to happen because God has a day of grace for every heart. And if God is speaking to you, if God is working in your heart, if you know that you're a sinner, that you need to yield your heart and life to the Lord Jesus, if you sense this morning that God is speaking to you, then you need to respond to him, for you know not what another day will bring. Today is the day of salvation. We're never promised tomorrow. A young man over in Northern Ireland attended a gospel meeting. His heart was stirred. He made comment to a friend as he left the meeting that one day he was determined he would give his heart to Jesus. He hopped onto his motorbike and he took off down the road on his way home and he never made it. He rounded a bend and met a car head on, and he was ushered into eternity just like that. You cannot guarantee another moment. If God is speaking to you, then you need to open your heart and your life to him. But let, uh, let's just read these verses of Paul. Paul goes on to say, Verse 25, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Now, is this just an imaginary thought? Is this a hopeful glance at the promises of God that Paul is drawing on here? What is the anchor that is grounding this truth in the heart and mind of the Apostle Paul. Note, as it is written, and we're going to come into this more fully when we get to the end of this chapter, but listen to these words. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away on godliness from Jacob. Who is the Israel God is speaking about here? Is it the church? No. It's the nation of Israel. Now, this is my final point. For this is my covenant with them. You see, God has promised. But what has happened? 
we'll look at the next part. When I take away their sins. See, the promise hasn't been fulfilled yet. But it will be. God has not cast away his people. God has a purpose. And he's working out that purpose. I did say this was the final thought, and it is, because this is part of the thought I'm giving you. Come for the final reference to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah, this is easy to remember. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. We'll read through to verse 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Ah, you say, I thought that when Jesus spoke to his disciples in the upper room, he said to them, this is the blood of the new covenant. How many new covenants are there? You see, God made a covenant with Israel. God made a covenant with the church. When Jesus came and died upon the cross and gave his life, he sealed the new covenant for the church with his blood. But what about the covenant that God gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? God said, I have a new covenant. But that new covenant will not be fulfilled yet. But there will come a time when it shall be. It will be fulfilled. Now let's go back to the reference. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. See, that's the new covenant that God will establish with his people Israel. When will that new covenant be sealed? When Christ returns. So Paul is now reminding you and I this morning that we need to examine in our heart, has God made a promise to us? Have we read through his word and as we read, we sense, we feel, we are assured that God is speaking to our hearts through this promise? If we have that assurance, then let's not falter in our faith. Let's not worry if things don't appear to be working out in our immediate future or in the avenues or areas of our thoughts. Things may not always work out the way we would like them to, want them to. And life might not always fall out for us in pleasant places. But remember the psalmist David who said, our lines have fallen out in pleasant places, also said, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You see, even in death for the Christian, that is a pleasant place because God is there. So here Paul, in chapter 11 of Romans, is asking, Has God cast away his people? Certainly not. Are you disobedient? Are you unbelieving? Are you somehow sensing that you've wandered away from God? Here's the question. Has God cast away his people? Hear the answer. Certainly not. Will you come back to him this morning? Will you confess the folly?
of your ways. Will you stand once more upon the promise of his word and look forward in anticipation to the coming of the Lord Jesus when every eye will see him? Let's bow for prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for your word today. We appreciate that there are some things that are hard for us to understand, and yet we sense, we know in our heart that your word is true. Keep us faithful, we pray. Remind us constantly of your promises. Help us to know at all times that you are with us. And as we face the journey of our lives, may we rest assured that God will not forsake his people. And this we pray in our Savior's name and for his sake. Amen.